Welcome to Eyes on Access, Children's Vision and Eye Health and Community Health Centers. I'm Donna Fishman. I'm the director of the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health at Prevent Blindness. And we are so thrilled to be sponsoring this webinar. I'm going to talk in a moment about our sponsors. Um, if you're just joining, I ask just please go ahead and put in the chat um, who you are. Of course, your name will come up and where you're from, what health center you're from, maybe what state you're in. Thank you so much for being here. A couple, a few quick housekeeping items. Please place your questions in the Q&A tab, and that's what we'll be monitoring. You can chat with each other about where you're from in the chat, but any questions should go in the Q&A tab. We appreciate that. We are offering a certificate of attendance, um, and Wilcock will be able to um, create those for you, and you can email her. We will also send this information out after. We are also offering CMEs through the AAFP, and Luke Ertl will be our contact for that. Again, we'll send that information after. We are recording the webinar and we will send the link to the recording and slides with the links also that have the links embedded for some of our resources out afterwards. And finally, we hope that you will can complete the evaluation so that we can make sure we do a good job for the second webinar in the series and throughout. At the end, we'll mention November 1st at 2 p.m. We'll be featuring a second children's vision webinar where we'll be talking about different models for children's vision care in community health centers. So be on the lookout for that one, November 1st at 2 p.m. One of the big thank you to our sponsors and, and funders. Janssen is very graciously um, underwriting this webinar today. It's a farm, one of the pharmaceutical companies of Johnson & Johnson, Prevent Blindness, and, and our National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health, along with the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved and the School-Based Health Alliance, which is participating as part of its grant from HRSA, you'll see on the left side. Um, and we appreciate certainly HRSA's support for this webinar. I want to especially welcome quickly the, as I mentioned, HRSA, um, any of the health centers that are participating today that have received the early childhood um, development grants from HRSA. I think this information will be really useful for you, and we're happy that you are here. I'm going to introduce now, and we'll hear from all of our co-sponsors today. Um, Xavier Thompson is the Retina Global Field Director and medical science liaison for Janssen Pharmaceuticals. And he will give us a welcome. He, by training, is a doctor of optometry. And in perhaps the most important, Xavier attended Xavier University as an undergraduate. So I love to say that. Um, Paula Fields is the Senior Vice President of Consulting and Technical Assistance at the School-Based Health Alliance. And we're so, so thrilled she's co-sponsoring. She's been working over 20 years in this field. She's a nurse by training, and she has recently served nearly a decade on the Board of Directors for an FQHC. Luke Ertl is here also, uh, our other co-sponsor from the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved. And he is, in his role, he works with um, training and technical assistance to support health centers across the country. And he runs the ACU's Eye Health and Vision Care Program. And in that capacity, he staffs the ACU's Vision Services Committee. He is a passionate advocate for vision and eye health. So I'm going to turn it over to Xavier for a welcome, and then I will talk a little bit more about Prevent Blindness and then introduce Paula and Luke. So Xavier, welcome. Hi, Donna. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, as Donna said, my name is Xavier Thompson, and I am a part of the global team at Johnson & Johnson. And you know, I serve as the field director for medical science liaisons, and I couldn't be more proud to represent J&J &J at today's webinar. I'm actually gonna take a different route today. So I don't have much time. Um, so I'd actually like to share a brief story um, about what I believe highlights the importance of access to vision screenings. So my wife, Stephanie was raised in a really small town in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And I mean, her town was so small that she actually lived on an unnamed street until she was in high school. Now, when Stephanie was in the first grade, she actually had really grave difficulty seeing the board. Um, and to compensate, she would glance down at the paper of the children that sat next to her. And she remembers doing this for weeks. 
Um, but what actually stood out to her was um, the day she was accused of cheating by her teacher. And of course, from the outside looking in, it clearly looked as though she was cheating. Um, now, my wife has a very unique way of setting the record straight. And, and I say that diplomatically, meaning I can never win an argument. Um, but at that tender age of six, she simply told the teacher, I'm not cheating. She didn't even get the answer right. And that response, of course, got her into more trouble. Um, but those series of events actually led her to getting screened and then being placed in glasses. Now, there are numerous details I left out due to time constraints. Um, you know, but I, I think, you know, the accusation of cheating, even though she won't admit it, is still haunting her, still stuck with her. Um, and, you know, what I also think about are the countless children who are still experiencing that to this day. Um, you know, I am just glad that I work for a company who strives to improve access, to create healthier communities, you know, and put a healthy mind, body, and environment within the reach of everyone. So on behalf of Johnson & Johnson, thank you to Prevent Blindness, our panelists, for your countless work in making a difference in children's lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Xavier. And I, I actually just shared your, your wife's story yesterday. It's a really powerful story. Now, now I'm glad we have it on the recording. Thank you. Um, so as I said, I'm Donna Fishman from Prevent Blindness. I direct our National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health. We are a busy group here at Prevent Blindness. We have a very broad mission to prevent blindness and preserve sight. We work across the lifespan. We work in several areas, as you'll see on the slide. The National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health has a mission to improve children's vision through strong partnerships, sound science, and targeted public policy. So all of our work at Prevent Blindness is really about creating equity and making sure that all people in this country have equitable access to quality vision screening, eye care, and treatment. We do that through public and professional education, such as our webinar today, our advocacy work, certified vision screening training you will hear about a bit later, and then through community and patient engagement programs. So I hope you'll check out our websites to learn a lot more about us. And I'll turn it over to Luke for an introduction. Thank you so much, Donna. Uh, again, my name is Luke Erdl. I'm the program director at the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved. ACU is a transdisciplinary membership network uniting clinicians, advocates, and organizations to lead advocacy, clinical, operational, and equity excellence to develop and support clinicians and the healthcare work workforce caring for America's underserved communities. We support thousands of clinicians and organizations each year with technical assistance, programs, advocacy, and more. And we began our work in the realm of eye health and vision services in 2017. Uh, and as you can see on screen, most of uh, what we do revolves around providing some small startup and expansion grants for federally qualified health centers and lookalikes to get uh, eye clinics started, and also providing them with technical assistance, or well, the grantees as well as other health centers across the country with technical assistance. And we do that through our vision services committee, which is a... Um, a group of 20 people, mainly optometrists from FQHCs and lookalikes from around the country, um, along with some advocates, administrators, uh, and other people who are passionate advocates of, of uh, expanding vision services to uh, the underserved. Um, one thing also, or some other ways that we do support health centers in this uh, area is that we provide free uh, job postings for optometry uh, vacancies for up to two months on our job board. So in that way we can help connect um, optometrists to these open positions and get them staffed. And we also have a number of different resources on our webpage. So you can follow that QR code or go to www.clinicians.org to find out more. Thanks, Donna. Thank you so much, Luke. And Paula. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the National School-Based Health Alliance, we're excited you're here. The reason I'm here is we believe that all children and adolescents deserve to thrive. But as a working mom and Mimi and nurse, I see many students who struggle because they lack equitable access to needed services such as medical, behavioral health, dental, and vision. Um, I've personally experienced with my own children what having access to needed services directly in the schools make possible, as well as for the child who came and told me he had a frog pee in his eye and it ended up being a toxin and emergency, thus um, one of the exciting, um, I think, reasons that I'm uh, here today. And that's why I'm a fierce advocate for school-based health care. And to get us started a little bit about the National School-Based Health Alliance, 
We are the voice for school-based health care, and we are a DC-based nonprofit, been around since 1995. And our focus includes advocating for high-quality health care in schools through policy, standards, data, and training like today to support and grow school-based health care, including school-based health centers. And we hope you'll join us in, um, in November for part two of the webinar series, and we'll do a little bit deeper dive in providing school-based vision services then. Thank you, Donna. Thanks so much, Paula. And now it is my pleasure to turn the program over to our moderator today, Dr. Stacy Lyons. Dr. Lyons is a professor of optometry and serves as chair of the Specialty Care and Vision Science Department at the New England College of Optometry, or NECO. She provides pediatric care as well at the Charles River Community Health Center in Brighton, Massachusetts. She is currently serving, I'm very proud to say, as chair of the advisory committee to the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health at Prevent Blindness. She's also served as the vision care um, chair, um, chair of the vision care section, sorry, for the American Public Health Association and several additional roles as well. And she also served on the advisory board of women in optometry. So I'm going to now turn the program over to Dr. Lyons. Welcome. Thank you so much, Donna. And thank you so much to our sponsors. Um, we have an exciting program today and um, let me introduce the panel. Let's start with Dr. Phoebe Leinhardt. She's an associate professor at the Department of Ophthalmology at Emory University School of Medicine. Her clinical interests include pediatric anterior segment and keratoplasty, pediatric cataracts, pediatric and adult strabismus, and global pediatric eye care. Dr. Linhard received her bachelor's degree from Davidson College in North Carolina. She attended medical school and completed her internship, residency, and fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Lenhardt is board certified by the American Board of Ophthalmology. She's been honored with awards from the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus and the American Academy of Ophthalmology. She serves on the advisory board of Prevent Blindness Georgia and the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health. Dr. Wakefield is a pediatrician serving the Healthcare Partners of South Carolina, a federally qualified health center in Conway, South Carolina. Originally from Oregon, she has embraced the chance to live and work in several places, including the Gambia, West Africa during her Peace Corps service and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention where she worked while earning her master's in public health. She earned her medical degree at Penn State College of Medicine and completed her pediatrics residency at the Medical University of South Carolina. Her interest in vision screening started with her time at Healthcare Partners, where she developed a quality improvement project through the Community Champions Program, which was a joint project with the Medical University of South Carolina and HRSA to help primary care providers design and implement quality improvement programs in their clinics. Next, we have Dr. Kay Nottingham Chaplin. She is the Education and Outreach Coordinator for Prevent Blindness, working primarily with the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health with technical assistance and the online Prevent Blindness Children's Vision Screening Certification course. Dr. Nottingham Chaplin has worked in vision screening for more than 22 years and has co-authored published papers regarding vision screening and presented nearly 250 national webinars and evidence-based vision screening lectures at local through international venues. She helped create the vision screening guidelines by age and the small steps for big vision an eye health informational toolkit for parents and caregivers, which is designed to reduce the gap between vision screening referrals and the follow-up exams. We have, a, as I said, a robust agenda for you today. Um, Dr. Leinhardt, Lenhardt will give an overview of children's vision and eye health and increase your knowledge about common pediatric vision disorders. Dr. Nottingham Chaplin will then discuss evidence-based screening skills and completing referrals for eye care. 
Dr. Wakefield will raise the importance of integration of pediatric primary care and eye care in the community health centers. As Donna said, Q&A will come after that. So please put your questions in the Q&A box below. Also, with your registration, many of you submitted your burning questions. I think some of the presentations might touch on many of these questions, but I'll circle back to them if they haven't been addressed. And I'll be monitoring that Q&A box as we go along. And then we'll discuss resources. Donna and Luke will come back and close us out. So thank you all for being here today and let's get our program started. Dr. Lenhardt, welcome. Thank you, everyone. Give me just one moment to share my screen. Okay, um, well, thank you so much. Um, can everyone see the screen? Thank you so much for having me to speak this afternoon. It's such a privilege um, to be a part of this important conference. Um, I'm Phoebe Lenhart. I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist at Emory in Atlanta, but I'm coming, you coming to you today from the Grady Eye Clinic uh, in downtown Atlanta. And I'm going to take about 15 minutes to lay out and try to fit together some of the puzzle pieces um, shown here that make up children's vision and vision screening. I have no financial interest to disclose. The framework of my puzzle will consist of a description of some common pediatric eye conditions. I'm also gonna go over the purpose of vision screening and some considerations for children with special needs. Finally, I'll give some general guidelines about when to refer children that you might be seeing. So many of you might be familiar with some of the most common pediatric eye conditions, such as conjunctivitis or pink eye, corneal abrasions um, demonstrated here on fluorescein staining or styes um, of the eyelids that can sometimes lead to ocular surface disease. But what is the most common pediatric eye condition? Well, it's refractive error um, or needing glasses. So there's hyperopia in which children are farsighted, myopia in which children are nearsighted. That means they see better close up than far away. Um, or astigmatism, and that refers to an uneven curvature of the lens or the cornea in the eye that can, bl can blur vision. Now, many young kids are naturally farsighted, but as they grow, often they will become less farsighted and may eventually even become nearsighted. Um, a lot of adults end up nearsighted. So, in fact, pediatric myopia or nearsightedness is a growing problem that I wanted to mention as a part of this talk. By 2050, there will be 3 billion more people with myopia and 775 million more people with high myopia, so myopia greater than about six diopters, than in the year 2000. This myopic progression is occurring in all ethnic groups with slightly higher rates in children of East and or Southeast Asian descent, depending on age. Some public health approaches to combating this problem have included um, prototype natural light classrooms like the one shown in the photo here. Now, some risk factors for myopic progression include genetics, earlier age of onset, um, increased screen time or time spent on near work. And some of the evidence supporting um, this comes from particularly the Comet study that was published in ophthalmology in 2007. And that showed that children with two myopic parents, two nearsighted parents, and who had higher baseline myopia at the time of diagnosis were more likely to go on to develop high myopia. With regards to age of onset, work by WHO and co-authors showed that each year of delay in onset age significantly reduced the chances of developing myop myopia. And a study published in 2021 looking at nearly 35 years of data in Taiwan, showed that working distance and electronic device use contribute to the development of myopia and high myopia. So this may explain why the prevalence of myopia increases with higher levels of education. So why is all this important? Vision is obviously critical to children's development, physically, cognitively, and socially. So uncorrected vision problems really can impair child development interfere with learning, and even lead to permanent vision loss. Therefore, early detection and treatment are critical. There are multiple studies 
reporting improve, improved reading outcomes and academic performance in primary school children who receive glasses. So this is a really important study that I'm showing you here that was published in 2021 in JAMA Ophthalmology, one of the biggest ophthalmology journals that included over 2,300 students in the Baltimore area and showed the positive impact of glasses on academic achievement. Students in grades three through seven who received eyeglasses through a school-based vision program achieved better reading scores over one year. Particularly, there were large gains for girls, for students in special education, and for students performing in the lowest quartile at baseline. Pediatric eye, vision, eye disorders also contribute to mental health issues in children. So this was a large uh, systematic review that was published in 2022 that showed that vision impaired children had significantly higher scores of anxiety and depression than normally sighted children. And furthermore, in particular, myopic children experienced higher, higher scores of depression. So what a great lead in to the importance of pediatric vision screening. Vision screening in children is intended to identify these common eye problems, but also some of the less common eye conditions in children that can lead to permanent vision loss. So these are some photos from Prevent Blindness Georgia um, vision screenings in past years. And vision screening can be performed by primary, eye, primary care providers, trained laypersons, as in school vision screenings, and eye care providers. So vision screening techniques are either provider-based, utilizing traditional techniques, um, such as um, acuity testing, inspection, red reflex testing, or they can be instrument-based. And photo screeners, shown as here on the right, cannot tell us what a patient's vision is, but can assess if a risk factor for amblyopia is present, even in the youngest children. So these are quite amazing. Vision screening aims to determine whether a child has decreased vision and if a risk factor for amblyopia is present. So some of you may be asking, what is amblyopia? So it's decreased vision uh, in one eye or both eyes that did not receive adequate early stimulation. So it's technically defined as an intraocular or between eye difference of two lines on the eye chart or a visual acuity worse than or equal to 2030 with best correction in place. So obviously for young children unable to read the eye chart, uh, we rely heavily on whether a child is exhibiting a visual preference for one eye or the other. Now, what causes amblyopia? So there are three main categories of what we term amblyogenic risk factors. First of all, refractive. That means that either there's an unequal glasses prescription between the two eyes, or there's a strong need for glasses in both eyes that has gone uncorrected at an early age. Next, strabismic means that there's misalignment of the eyes of any sort. This can be eyes crossing inward, eyes drifting outward, vertical misalignment. And finally, deprivation, in which there's some sort of structural abnormality of the eye um, compared to the other, and therefore the eye can't work to its fullest potential. So the eyes compete with one another, and the eye that has something different about it becomes the weaker eye, and the other eye becomes the stronger eye. So an example of this would be a congenital cataract. So I know this is not fair, but I'm going to go ahead and give you a pop quiz just to make sure you're not asleep out there. Um, what type of amblyopia might this three-year-old girl with poorly controlled intermittent exotropia have? So if you answered strabismic, you're correct. Um, this is associated with misalignment of the eyes, and the vision in this child's right eye is likely to be weaker. How about this infant with a congenital cataract, which you can see here distorting the red reflex in her left eye? The answer here is deprivation. So she's likely, her brain is likely to want to turn off her left eye because of the presence of that cataract. When something is different about one eye of a child, the affected eye will become weaker, potentially leading to lifelong vision loss. So why should we care about amblyopia? Amblyopia is the leading cause of preventable monocular vision loss in the United States, and it affects about 3% of all children in the United States. And as I mentioned before, with many sorts of vision disorders, in addition to impaired vision in the underused eye, amblyopia also causes loss of depth perception, a reading speed about 25% lower than other children, impaired motor skills and loss of dexterity, lower self-confidence and lower self-esteem. Other signs and symptoms of potential vision loss that I wanted to discuss and that we should be looking for when we perform pediatric vision screening are shown here. So in general, if an infant greater than eight weeks of age is not making eye contact, 
then that is indicative of decreased vision or maybe at the very least delayed visual maturation. And that child probably should be referred to an eye care provider. If there's a head tilt or a face turn, you might suspect strabismus, which is misalignment of eyes, nystagmus, or high astigmatism. An inability to com comply with vision screening of any sort um, always makes us wonder whether the child might not be seeing well. Tearing can be indicative of congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction or congenital glaucoma. Photophobia can indicate congenital glaucoma or ocular inflammation. And squinting can be indicative of re refractive error or strabismus. So those in general are all things that you would want to consider referring on to an eye care provider. Finally, people often ask, what's the difference between vision screening and a complete eye exam? Well, vision screening really is intended to be a simple check to detect vision problems early. It does not involve pupillary dilation. Usually the outcome is pass or fail. And if the, if the vision screening has failed, then they need referral on to an eye care provider or if there's still cons considerable concern for some eye problem, even if they did not fail the screening. Now an eye exam is a detailed check of your eyes and the eye health. It does involve pupil dilation so that the back part of the eye can be examined as well. It usually results in a diagnosis of some sort of eye problem. And also follow-up is recommended as provided by the eye care provider. So finally, some considerations for children with special needs. Both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Ophthalmology recommend that all children have their eyes checked during, during the newborn period and thereafter at all routine well-child visits. So with regards to children with special needs, there's some special considerations, however. Shown here are some populations of children at higher risk um, for eye disorders who warrant referral for an actual eye examination. So these are children, again, with observable eye anomalies or ocular, any sort of ocular anomaly. Um, it can be external or it can be the eye itself. Uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, um, sometimes systemic conditions that have known associated ocular anomalies, uh, like oculocutaneous albinism, for example. A first degree relative with misalignment of the eyes or a known history of a lazy eye or amblyopia. A history of prematurity, less than 32 weeks gestational age. Or any child that the parents believe to have an eye problem. Um, parents are often astute observers and um, it's good to trust their intuition in many of these cases. So finally, um, let's talk about indications for referral based on findings for children undergoing vision screenings. So I highly recommend the article by Lo and Chang about pediatric vision screening that I've cited here. And I've summarized a few of the key tables here. So some of the things that you want to look out for are on red reflex testing. Again, if there's an abnormality, an absent, a white, a dull, an asymmetric red reflex, um, this is the instrument shown to the left um, that is most useful in looking at both red reflexes simultaneously. That's a direct ophthalmoscope. On external inspection is if there's lid drooping, ptosis, or a hemangioma near the eye or involving the eyelids. If there's unequal pupil size or poor reaction to light or irregular pupil shape. If there's asymmetrical or displaced corneal light reflex. Um, if a child fails to meet um, screening criteria on instrument-based screening or if you see a refixation movement when performing cover testing um, on a child, then those are all situations in which you would wanna refer that child on to an eye care provider. Now, if you're, excuse me, sorry. If you're, let me go back one slide. If you're referring onward um, on the basis of visual acuity, here's a helpful table that's summarizing indication for referral by age of the child. So uh, any child who's a newborn should blink to light. If you don't see that, then you become suspicious and would want to consider referring them onward. Um, under six months of age, um, any child greater than about two to three months of age should be able to fix and follow. And if you don't see that, consider referral. Children age three to four years should see um, at least 2050 um, in either eye, four to five years, uh, at least 2040, and after that, at least 2030. Um, and they cannot have a two-line difference uh, between the two eyes on visual acuity screen. Otherwise, they should be referred. So it's important to keep in mind that pediatric vision screening often leads to high referral rates. So in many settings, the number of referrals for failed vision screenings far outweighs the system's ability to accommodate these children for full eye exams. 
So fortunately, there are a range of eye care providers um, who can assist with providing eye examinations and glasses for these children who um, fail their eye exams, or excuse me, fail their vision screenings, excuse me. Optometrists far outnumber ophthalmologists who far outnumber pediatric ophthalmologists. So in summary, um, pediatric vision screening really takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of patience, and it takes funding. And there are many barriers that patients may face, um, parents may face when their child is referred for eye care. Um, some of these are linguistic or language-based. Some of them are financial. Some of them have to do with time away from work. But it's important for us to do all that we can to streamline these processes because delay in diagnosis and treatment of eye conditions in children can lead to permanent loss of vision. So thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Linhard, and thank you um, for really emphasizing that connection between vision and child wellness and learning and the importance of maximizing that child's academic performance. So thank you so much. Thank you. And next, we're going to move on to Dr. Kay Nottingham Chaplin, and she's going to talk about evidence-based vision screening for children. Hey, I think you might be muted. Yeah, sometimes working with three screens can be a little confusing. So um, you are seeing my slides, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about evidence-based vision screening, some of the information um, you've already heard, but it doesn't hurt to hear it twice. Um, or three times or more. So, um, little technical difficulty here. Okay, so I do have a disclaimer in that um, I do 1099 contracted vision screening consulting for Good Light Company and School Health Corporation. So some of the vision screening charts that I'm showing today um, you will see Good Light's name on those tools because Good Light has an exclusive license to create or manufacture those tools. So that would be my disclaimer. I'm not pushing product. Um, so I wanted to also briefly talk about the CDC's vision screening guidance for refugees. And um, the guidance is to perform formal vision screening in all patients three years and older at the initial domestic medical screening and the use of alternate charts are okay and may be needed if they can't identify letters. And so lay symbols would be an appropriate chart. And the link is in the bottom if you want to delve into this deeper. So today I'm going to talk about observation for all ages, which should be done before screening talking about birth to the first birthday, the key to vision developmental milestone, ages one and two years, which would be instrument-based screening, ages three, four, and five years, optotype-based screening or eye charts, spoiler alert, no cell boat chart, or for ages three, four, and five, an alternative would be instrument-based screening, for ages six and older though, no instruments unless they can't do um, optotype based screening. So for six and older would be optotype based screening, spoiler alert, no Snellen chart. And I'm also going to be talking about follow-up on referrals. So with observation, this is a document that uh, the links in the bottom that looks at a parent's behavior and complaints. I do have some folks in community centers who actually go over this document with the families or they have families complete this document while they're in the waiting room. And I even have one because there's one here about holding books closely 
Um, so she'll even bring out a book or a coloring book as sort of a treat also, but to see how that child looks at books. So observation before screening on all children. And what's important is about the observation is if you find something on this document and they pass vision screening, you still make a referral. So the 18 vision developmental milestones looks at, has milestones for all months. This is just one page, uh, the links at the bottom. So it shows the age, the milestone, questions to ask, and then next steps, including activities that um, parents and caregivers can do. I forgot to start my timer, Dawn. So for ages one and two years um, would be instrument-based screening. So the recommended instruments are plus optics, obviously without visual acuity function for this age group, and SPOT. And um, this actually comes from a joint 2016 uh, recommendation from American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Ophthalmology, American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, and Certified Orthoptus. So for three, four, and five years, you can do either instrument-based or eye chart. So let's talk briefly about instrument-based. So instruments analyze the structure of the eyes. Instruments provide estimated information about amblyopia risk factors, such as significant refractive error, hyperopia, farsightedness, uh, myopia, nearsightedness, astigmatism, and anisometropia, which is a difference of a refractive error between the two eyes. I misalignment. Instruments do not measure visual acuity and will not give you information such as 2020, which eye charts measure, and will give you that visual acuity value. Measurements cannot be converted to visual acuity values because you're measuring two different aspects of vision because a child can have a significant refractive error but have good visual acuity, or conversely, the child can have little to no refractive error and poor visual acuity. So um, do not convert the results to visual acuity skills. This is a position statement put out by Sue Cotter, Sean Donahue, Bruce Moore, Kings and Queen in the uh, vision world. This uh, position statement is endorsed by the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health, the American Academy of Optometry, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. So if you want more information, there is a link to that, and that will give you the full position statement. So if you're going to do instruments, these are the recommended tools for ages three, four, and five years, plus optics without the visual acuity function, go check kids without the visual acuity function, and spot. So now let's look at optotype-based screening. The examples on the right would be for children until they know their letters in random order. Um, these are tests of visual acuity using optotypes, which is a Herman Snellen term for letters or symbols. And they measure visual acuity as interpreted by the brain. The definition is quantifiable measurement of the sharpness or clearness of vision when identifying specific optotype sizes at a standardized distance. So evidence-based standardized charts, you'll have a 10 feet screening distance between the chart and the eyes, like the, the top and the middle chart. And some are at five feet, like the VIP kit in the bottom right. So
So 10 feet, not 20 feet, and we'll have a 2032 line if they're standardized and not 2030. So within optotype based screening, you have two types of screening. One is threshold, and that's where you move down the chart until the child can no longer correctly identify the majority of optotypes. The full threshold will give you the two line difference. And in the, in the bottom here, um, illumination of the chart is important. And I have a lot of centers who actually use this ESV 1200, which has LED lights throughout the board and gives even lighting on the chart and can either be set on a shelf, hung on the wall, or there's also a stand, like an IV stand, so you can roll it around. Then the second type is critical line screening, like the one uh, image on the right. And this is just a pass refer, and you're only using the line size that the child needs to pass according to the child's age. Um, the pro is it is quick. The, the con is you will not, it is a pass refer and you will not uh, get a two line difference. So for six and older, no instruments. Here we're back to our charts. You'll see this first one, the sight line handheld kit has both lay assembles and Sloan letters. The APOS kit on the right has critical line and full threshold in both Sloan letters and lay assembles or a nine by 14 Sloan letters chart. So now let's talk about occluders. So for three, four and five year olds, no, well, for any age, no hands, no tissues, no paper or plastic cups. Now for three, fours and fives, no cover paddles. And why are these unacceptable? Because children can easily peek. So occluders for three years up until, uh, up until age 10 would be adhesive eye patches, two inch wide medical tape or occluder glasses. For ages 10 years and older, lollipop occluders or this Mardi Gras mask. And if you look at the Mardi Gras mask, you want to make sure it's not a pinhole mask. Um, that's an entirely different tool. And now, so um, Dr. Um, Linhart was talking about this, these children. So some of these children, they should receive an eye exam, even if they pass vision screening because they have a higher risk or vision disorders, and we talked about strabismus, ptosis, droopy eyelid, hearing impairment, motor such as CP, Down syndrome, cognitive impairment, those on the autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, diabetes, juvenile arthritis, uh, parents or siblings with a history of strabismus, amblyopia, again, the history of prematurity, less than 32 weeks, and parents who believe their child has a vision problem. And I totally agree, parents, listen to the parents. So the rate of confirmatory eye exams, according to the study on the bottom, is approximately five to 50% of children receive an eye exam after a referral from vision screening and we want to make those numbers better. So some common barriers to follow up eye care, uh, lack of transportation, I hear that one always. Uh, parents who cannot leave their job because they're afraid that they may lose their job or they just don't have time off built into their job. Uh, concerns about uh, insurance, no insurance, the initial eye exam costs, co-pays, costs of getting glasses if needed, um, and even some concerns about wearing glasses and what that may mean culturally. 
language and cultural barriers between the family and the provider, and lack of knowledge. And I hear this one too often, lack of knowledge about the importance of best vision now and for the futures, the, uh, for the future only. Um, so at the bottom is a link to the small steps for big vision uh, healthcare, which has um, lots of information to share with parents about the importance of the vision screening, the importance of the eye exam, how to schedule the eye exam, how, what questions to ask the eye doctor, the uh, association between vision and learning, association between vision and classroom behaviors. And I know that many of you have referral departments, which I think is awesome. Um, so good for you. And why is it important to resolve these barriers? Because of failed vision screening without follow-up that confirmatory eye exam, treatment, and ongoing vision care is not a complete vision screening. Undetected and untreated vision disorders may be difficult to treat, may lead to worsening vision, may lead to even permanent vision loss, and impact learning if not detected and treated early. So in looking at follow-up to eye care, I know some of you have on-site optometry services. So it would be um, awesome if you could have optometry or ophthalmology services on-site. And I know some that if the doctor thinks that child needs to have an eye exam now, they'll squeeze them into the on-site services. Um, or create a follow-up system to ensure the eye exam occurs. Identify and help to remove any barriers to care. And if you do have that referral department, I'm sure that's what they're doing. Use and enhance partnerships around barriers to care. And remember that follow-up is a critical component of vision screening. And I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Kay. And I love the pictures of your grandchildren. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> and, and I think you bring up an important point. And I think that um, the audience is here today because how do we close that gap? How do we make that gap smaller, even between vision screening and getting that comprehensive eye exam in order to close that loop? So thank you. And our next speaker is. Um, Dr. Wakefield, and she is going to talk about closing some of that loop with the role of the primary care provider in vision and eye health. Thank you, Dr. Wakefield. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. Uh, so my objectives today, um, talking about what, it, what are our roles as primary care providers um, in doing these vision screens for kids, um, a little bit about conducting the ocular assessment um, in the office, um, and then uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about is the quality improvement project that we did at Healthcare Partners to improve vision screening rates in our office, um, and then talking about some of our successes and some of the areas where we're still kind of struggling a little bit for coordinating those referrals for further eye care. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so first part, the primary uh, care provider's role. Next slide. Okay. So we as primary care providers, we are often the first people um, to assess a child's vision um, other than the parents who might notice that something seems a little off. We're the ones who can do a little bit more of a formalized assessment. Um, we also follow these children over time, um, and it's the repeated assessment of vision that really improves the sensitivity of our vision screening. Um, According to a Peds and Review article on vision screening, uh, those vision screening assessments in early childhood can reduce the risk of vision loss by age seven by more than 50%. Um, so proper screening by us as primary care providers can lead to those sooner diagnoses of vision problems or systemic problems. Next slide. Okay. Um, so the fun part, talking a little bit about ocular assessment. 
So I will say I am not an optometrist. I'm not an ophthalmologist. I'm a regular primary care pediatrician. So I don't have some of the cool stuff um, that can really do a very, very thorough assessment. Um, I'm just doing the vision screen. Um, so uh, part of that, um, number one, that you can start when you first see a, a newborn is assessing that red reflex. Um, that's also, uh, you're also assessing pupils at the same time because you're using that um, ophthalmoscope, um, shining the light um, over their eyes at about two to three um, feet away, um, looking for that red reflex, seeing do the pupils get smaller when you shine that bright light on them. Um, we're looking at the external appearance. Is there an ocular hemangioma right here? Is there a ptosis, a droopy eyelid? Um, are there other abnormalities um, with the face? Does one eye look bigger than another? These are all things where we can say, this doesn't look quite right. Somebody else uh, with some more specialized training needs to take a look. From, in terms of visual acuity screening, we actually can start that at the newborn age. The eye popping reflex with newborns where you turn out the light and their eyes get really wide, that is an assessment of vision acuity. If they're not doing that, then that's a sign that there could be some vision issues. Fixation and tracking, where you hold up the finger or uh, what I usually do is I wiggle my fingers and then I move to the left, move to the right, move up move down? Is the child following my fingers as they're moving? You can also use a toy. You can use the light from the ophthalmoscope. Um, at ages about six weeks to six months, you can do that with both eyes. Um, and then uh, when they're six months up to two years, you can um, cover one eye and try and do it just with one eye. If you have it in your office, an instrument-based screening um, uh, can be really helpful in terms of uh, for ages one and two. And I will say, for a lot of our patients due to um, language issues, we do still use our um, uh, vision screener up to three, four, five, if we're not able to really communicate um, with our patients. Um, once kids are three, four, or five, the best way to assess uh, visual acuity is with vision acuity charts, um, those Leia symbols, those Sloan letters. Um, but if you're not able to do that, or if you have a child who's not verbal, um, you can still use the instrument-based um, uh, vision screening. Um, as kids get older, you can do the cover uncover test to check for strabismus. Um, the Hirschberg or the corneal light reflex test is something that you can do the same time that you're assessing red reflex and pupils. Does the, um, does the light reflect equally off of the pupils? Um, and then you can assess the ocular motility and check for nystagmus when you are doing the uh, fixation and tracking. Again, follow the fingers or follow the toy. Um, and you can see uh, this lovely picture uh, of a pediatric ophthalmologist with all the fun toys that he uses to try and assess um, kids' uh, vision and fixation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so Dr. Lenhart and I both found uh, the same uh, pediatrics and review, um, really, really helpful article about uh, vision screening in kids. So I cannot say this table any better than the table does. Um, this is looking at the specific um, uh, assessments that you're doing, the proper age to do it, um, and then uh, some possible indications for a referral. So that is uh, a resource for you guys um, if, uh, to, to take a closer look at. I highly recommend this article. Next slide, please. So what are some of the things that we're looking for? Um, me as a pediatrician, if I see an ocular hemangioma, I'm referring that child to ophthalmology, I'm referring to dermatology right away. Uh, we can see nystagmus if when you're doing the fixation and tracking, if the eyeballs are just jumping all over the place, a specialist needs to take a look at that kiddo. Um, strabismus versus pseudostrabismus. Um, so you can see the second child here looks like maybe there could be a little bit of misalignment with the eyes, but it's actually because this child has a wide nasal bridge. Um, you do still need to keep an eye on kiddos with pseudostrabismus because uh, they could actually have an underlying strabismus as well. Well. Um, ptosis, cataracts, if there's a gaze deviation, um, if you notice a difference in globe size, we can see that when we are assessing the child. Um, a head tilt, um, anisocoria, leucoria, um, or those visual acuity deficits, um, if we see that, we know we got to refer. Next slide, please. Um, so this is talking a little bit more about um, the quality improvement project um, for our clinic. So um, I, like I said, I work at a federally qualified health center um, in uh, Northeastern South Carolina. 
Uh, we have four different clinics and we provide all kinds of services uh, from family medicine to ob pediatrics, behavioral, and we have new optometry services, which is amazing. Uh, I see primarily uninsured or um, uh, uninsured patients. Um, we have some private insurance and we also have some TRICARE families that we see. We have a large population of uh, families who have moved mostly from Central and South America, um, but also from uh, um, other areas as well. So in terms of the languages that my patients speak, mostly English, um, between 40 to 50% Spanish. Um, we also have a fairly large Portuguese population um, where I am in Ori County. Um, so I'm learning a couple of Portuguese phrases. Um, I also have kiddos who speak Mandarin, Vietnamese, Czech, um, and I have a patient who speaks Wolof, um, which is a um, West African dialect. Next slide. Okay. Um, so our vision screening improvement started in 2021. Uh, when I joined the HRSA Primary Care Training and Enhancement Program, the Community Champions Program. Uh, so I received training in something called Lean Six Sigma and uh, DMAIC. Um, these are strategies for quality improvement projects. Um, my green belt quality improvement project was to increase our vision screening rates because at our clinic, we were using the Snellen chart. Um, we really weren't able to assess children who were younger than five years old. Um, so we were missing a large um, uh, population um, within our, our kiddos. Part of the grant for this quality improvement training and project um, um, helped to uh, help us to acquire a well challenged spot vision screener to help screen those younger kiddos. Um, and then we were able to make other changes like getting rid of the Snellen chart, um, getting rid of a chart that was in the middle of a busy hallway, and instead getting those Sloan letters and Leia symbols in the rooms uh, for better uh, vision acuity testing. Um, and then also we made a, a cool little Spanish language which card um, to help our non-Spanish speaking nurses better communicate with those families who do primarily speak Spanish. Next slide, please. Um, so through this program, um, through working together as a team, we were able to get some awesome new resources. The Welch Allen Spot Vision Screener is uh, fantastic. Um, it is a handheld device. You stand about three feet away from the kiddo and on their end, they see bright lights um, and they hear uh, birds chirping and that gets their attention and they just need to stare there for between 10 to 30 seconds. Um, and that can uh, give us a bunch of information um, to uh, kind of estimate, is there myopia? Is there gaze deviation? Is there astigmatism? Uh, we have the Leia symbols and the Sloan letters in our rooms now. Um, so you can see uh, we put them up on the, um, on the back of the door. And on the other side of the room, we have a, a little uh, piece of tape that measures where 10 feet is away um, so that we can do the vision assessments in the room where it's quieter. Um, this is our uh, some of our Spanish phrases. Um, I worked with one of our um, native Spanish speaking nurses um, to make sure that um, we had the um, uh, had the words right. She also um, was really, really nice and let me uh, record her. Um, uh, so uh, there's also audio files um, that will um, where she's actually pronouncing everything properly. So our nurses can say like, um, can you see it? Lo ves or for the Leia symbols, you can see there's circles, there's a square, there's this thing that could be an apple or could be a heart. I've had kids call it a tooth, one kid call it a butterfly. Um, so just uh, uh, translating those into Spanish. Uh, so circle, circulo, butterfly, mariposa, things like that. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so through these numerous changes that uh, we we worked on as a team to uh, to improve stuff, uh, we were able to streamline the vision screening process as a whole. Uh, you can see from this lovely little uh, before and after spaghetti map, which keeps track of the steps that the nurses are doing as they are going about doing vision screening. Our before map, we would call a child back get their vitals in the triage room, go to this busy hallway that had the Snellen charts, um, make the kids stand 20 feet back, which was actually in front of another patient room, um, try and get them to, to tell us the things they see, then take them to the room, get the chief complained, then come see me, tell me um, what the results were for the vision acuity screening, and then I go in and talk further with the family. 
now that we have the screeners in the room, now that we have the um, uh, our instrument-based screening, uh, we've gotten rid of that busy, busy hallway. Um, so more stuff is happening in the rooms where it's quieter um, and kids are more comfortable actually telling us what they see or if they feel like they can't see. Next slide, please. Uh, definitely there were growing pains. Um, this is an example of the printout from the Well Challenge Spot Vision Screener. Um, so you can see if you look pretty close, there are a whole bunch of numbers that me as a regular pediatrician, I know that this is important, but I don't know exactly what this means. So I look more um, to the, the general readout that there is astigmatism. And you can see for the right eye and left eye, the astigmatism measurement is out of range. It's not only one, but two, um, kind of two squares out of range. So for me as a general pediatrician, um, if I saw this in a two-year-old or three-year-old, I would say, mm -hmm, you know, I think it's probably a good idea uh, for you to see uh, an optometrist or an ophthalmologist for a further evaluation. It's hard because I know that younger children, age one, age two, they can have astigmatism that they outgrow, um, usually by ages three or four. So I will, if I get one that is just slightly out of range, I'll ask the family, do you have any vision concerns? And if it's say, no, he, like, he will see a toy at the other end of the room and go running for it, no vision concerns, then I'll say, okay, so this is, things look a little off, vision is a little blurry, but this is something they could outgrow. Do you, um, do you want to go see an eye specialist or do you wanna keep an eye on things? We have that discussion, that shared decision-making. Um, um, and so that, that's what uh, we had to figure out, what was our threshold for referring or not. Of course, if the family is concerned about vision, I'm sending them to a specialist. Uh, we also had to figure out the proper billing codes um, and then which insurances will pay for vision acuity um, screening if we're using the instrument-based ocular screening rather than the vision acuity charts. So I had to um, learn some new um, CPT codes. I was familiar with 99173. Now I have to be familiar with 99177. Next chart. Okay. Um, so coordinating referrals is an area that we're still working on. Okay. Go ahead. Right. Uh, so, uh, like I said, we now have Drs. Cornwell and Dr. White, um, who are optometrists. They are amazing. Um, so we're able to connect families with easier to access eye care, sometimes even same day. I had a little girl come to see me for a red eye. And when I examined her, I saw that she had this little rash that was extending up. And I said, oh, oh, this looks like herpes keratitis. Um, and so I was able to call over to optometry and say, Dr. White, um, I'm pretty sure this kiddo has herpes keratitis, can you do a more thorough eye exam? And we were able to say, um, she was able to do the exam. Yes, herpes keratitis. She was able to do topical treatment. I was able to get her on oral anti, um, antiviral therapy. Um, and Dr. White was able to follow up with her and make sure that things were getting better. Um, so currently, um, our optometry can only see self-pay families, and they just got approved for Medicare, um, but we're still waiting on some of the other insurance companies and Medicaid. And once we have that, we'll be able to do even more referrals for them. Uh, so our internal referral process, we identify a vision um, abnormality. Uh, we notify the family. We do a referral to them uh, uh, in our EMR system, uh, and they have a referral coordinator on their end who keeps track. Um, and then we have these cool little checkout slips that we give families to tell them, here's when your next appointment is. Um, and I will write on that slip, um, needs to schedule a visit with optometry. And so the family knows and front desk knows that they need to schedule a follow-up visit with optometry. Next slide. Uh, there is definitely room for improvement for external referrals. Those kiddos who currently have insurance that we can't send directly to Dr. Cornwell or Dr. White, um, we have a list of local eye doctors um, and discuss which ones are comfortable seeing younger kids, which ones are cheaper. Um, since we don't do uh, an external referral because a lot of optometry offices won't take a referral from us, um, we don't have a method for flagging and following up um, we have whether a child saw an eye doctor or not. A lot of times I'll schedule a follow-up visit and at the follow-up visit I'll say, hey, were you able to go? Um, if we have to refer to ophthalmology, um, we refer them to Medical University of South Carolina, um, which is two hours away in Charleston, um, and that does go through a referral coordinator 
families are asked to call our office um, if they don't hear about an appointment within two weeks. Um, and then because the referral coordinator does all the referrals for everything, um, we're still trying to figure out a good method for um, following up um, if those kiddos saw ophthalmology or not. Um, and sometimes I am able to call directly to the on-call ophthalmologist at MUSC and say, hey, pretty please, can you get this kid in sooner rather than later? Um, so that helps as well. Okay. Next slide. Um, this is a list of um, some of the resources. So that article that Dr. Lenhart and I both talked about, um, there's another article in pediatrics um, from a few years earlier um, talking about the vision screening process. Um, uh, I found a cool little blog post from a pediatric ophthalmologist um, called How to Conquer the Pediatric Eye Exam. Um, that was helpful. Um, if you're interested in the quality improvement project that I did, um, I included that as well. And then just some general resources in terms of developmental stuff, the CDC Milestone Tracker app, and then healthychildren.org, which is from the American Academy of Pediatrics that has lots of little tip sheets for parents that I use all the time. Um, and last slide. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Wakefield. And I really appreciate when I think about you just starting having vision at the Community Health Center in Boston, the relationship between optometry or vision care services and the health centers is greater than 50 years old. So it's wonderful to have new center starting and that the importance of that, just as you were talking about the importance of that. So thank you. And thank you to all of our um, panelists today. And I want to um, tell you that we're a little short on time for question and answers. So I we're going to send out an FAQ with your questions. And so keep them coming. And Donna, how about some resources and Luke? Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, oh, let me put myself back on. Here we go. I think we have time for a couple of questions, Dr. Lyons. Um, so go ahead. And there's a couple questions in the q and I I don't know if, if there's one or two you want to particularly um, look at. I do want to, is it okay if I chime in about the IRD question? We got a question. Can you speak to the diagnostic journey of a child with an inherited retinal disease, what that might look like, and steps would a um, HCP take in disease management. So I just want to comment that we don't probably have time for a full, full answer on that. We actually did a webinar back in May on inherited retinal diseases. And so I will make sure to send out the that recording. It was really informative. We had a genetic counselor. We had a pediatric ophthalmologist who specializes in inherited retinal diseases. And I think that will give you a lot of the question, a lot of the answers to the questions. Several questions came in also in the um, in your registration, and a lot of them were setting up systems and things like that. Um, I think a lot of those questions will be answered in November when we hear about the different models of children's eye care in health centers and in school-based health centers. And so I think we'll we'll wait to answer some of those questions there. Dr. Lyons, any quick quick questions you saw that you'd like to tackle or or send to one of sure. any of actually calls? one for one for Kay. Um, Kay, what would be your top takeaways or to do or changes school nurses should make? Follow up with kids. Nurses are so, so busy um, on the NASN listserv and the things that they have to deal with is just overwhelming in, in like a day's time. Um, but I would like to see them figure out a way to follow up with families to particularly talk about their barriers or, or their concerns. And that would be my quick takeaway. Thank you. Great question. Thanks, Kay. I'm gonna. We just have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna talk about a few resources. But somebody, um, when when Dr. Wakefield talked about billing, Luke, I'm gonna just put you on the spot for a moment here. Do you want to mention the billing and coding webinars that we did? And Julie is gonna put in the link. Julie Grutzmacher, my colleague um, from Prevent Blindness, is gonna put in the link for all of our archived um, webinars that we've done in partnership with um, ACU and also NAC. 
Sure thing. Thanks, Donna. So yeah, just real real briefly. So uh, as Donna was mentioning, ACU, NAC, and Prevent Blindness uh, had worked on an, uh, a series of web, different webinars around uh, vision services or starting up and expanding vision services, and one of which focused on billing. Um, so there are a number of uh, you know, a number of items you might be able to pull from some of those recordings as Julie puts those in the chat box. Anything else you'd add, uh, Donna? I think that's it, that um, we had two sessions on billing and coding, which is how complicated it is. So really appreciate that question. And it's such a great resource to have that. So I don't have time to talk about everything. Dr. Wakefield had in her resources also the Learn the Signs Act Early. It's a milestone tracker, and there's several different ways to track milestones. And again, we will send all of these out. I do want to mention Dr. Nottingham Chaplin did a great job talking about vision screening. We actually have a certification course. We have some scholarships available for that course. And our affiliates in Iowa, Georgia, Wisconsin, Ohio, Texas, and North Carolina all offer their own courses as well. And we can help connect you to those. Um, Julie put the link in, but please be sure to check out Vision Screening Guidelines by Age, several resources in here as well, um, including the list of tools, which Julie also put in there. Um, our Small Steps for Big Vision, about 50 downloadable fact sheets that Dr. K actually created. She mentioned it. Here is the link and then the link to the signs of possible vision disorders. Um, we also have fact sheets on many, many of the um, vision disorders, common and uncommon for children. I do encourage you to subscribe to our Prevent Blindness e-news and um, also um, to our National Center, to the e-news in our National Center as well. We do run a couple of financial programs and have a whole fact sheet on many, many financial programs to help with the cost of both eye care, eye exams, examinations, and glasses. And here is the person to contact. Again, we will send this out. And then here are a few other programs. And again, our affiliates also have access to some of the vouchers and gift certificates. You might also check with the ophthalmology and optometry schools, training programs to see what kind of charity care and clinics in communities that they run as well when you're setting up your systems of care. And here is our, um, for more information, um, here's how you can contact us and learn a little bit more about us. Um, please feel free to reach out. Um, Dr. Lyons, any last minute inspiration for folks before we chime off today? Thank you so much for joining today. And um, just remember that this is part one of a two-part seminar. Yes, the next, the next session will be November 1st at 2 p.m. We will send the registration to you. Right now, we have secured three different um, representatives who will be talking about these really great models um, in school-based health centers from the Cincinnati Health Department. So different, also different administrations. So we have the health, the public health department that runs these vision centers. And then we have a health center in Alexandria, Virginia, talking about the vision services and health partners of Western Ohio will be talking about mobile services in schools. And we are, we will possibly have one more, one more surprise guest. So it will, that will really be a deep dive into how do you set up these models, um, might answer some questions about setting up billing and coding. Um, how do you get the funding to do this? It's always a question people ask to make sure and how many patients do you need to make it worthwhile to do these services? Um, how, do, how does a school-based health center interact with the school nurse who's often doing the vision screening? So we hope to um, cover all that and more. And Dr. Lyons, again, will be back to moderate that session as well. So thank you all so much for your participation today. We're thrilled to have you and we'll see you again on November 1st. Thank you.